If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land.
stand for the pledge of allegiance. whose God is the Lord. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations.
received one of those yellow Connect cards, and if you did, I'd ask you to fill out the information on that card and return it to the uh, Welcome Center on your way out after the service. Uh, and we, we have a, a gift for you for being here with us today, and I just wanted to thank you for that. If, there, if you're here for more than your first time, we welcome you back. We're glad that you chose to be here on this holiday weekend, and uh, we're in for a, a good day as we celebrate uh, our freedom in Christ. Every day is our Independence Day as we celebrate our freedom in Christ. Just wanted to just ask you for some help. Uh, we're uh, trying to put together a new student ministry, a youth ministry, and uh, today at uh, two o'clock, I'm looking for some volunteers. Maybe you all have gotten the, the, uh, the announcement, the, uh, the email that was sent out. I'm looking for volunteers to help hand out these flyers. Uh, what I was thinking about doing is going to where the people are, the park, the gas station, the convenience stores, and looking for uh, people who might have teenagers and just hand them out and just invite them to come. I'm asking for an hour of your time from 2 to 3 o'clock today to do that. And if you, you can do that, show up outside and uh, we'll have a time of prayer and then we'll go to uh, the, those areas and uh, hopefully we'll be able to generate some interest in the, in the student ministry that's going to uh, change from Wednesdays to Sundays from 4 to 6. And uh, we're doing that so that uh, we'll have uh, more opportunities to reach those who are involved in sports and who have homework during the week. Uh, maybe that'll make a difference. So if you can help with that, I look forward to seeing you today from 2 to 3. Thank you. And we're glad that you're here.
things going on around us, our praise belongs to you. There are so many things that Satan tries to get us to worship, that he tries to convince us to make priorities in our lives. You alone are exalted over all. God, we pray that you give us strength, that you give us power, that you give us wisdom, that we allow you to defeat those other thrones in our lives, that you would be exalted over all.
Thank you, Virginia. Inquire. Please turn your Bibles, if you haven't already, to uh, Galatians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at two verses there, verses 1 and 13, and then we'll be jumping over to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, if you'll mark your Bibles. Today I'm going to talk about uh, true freedom. True freedom is found in Christ. Um, when you think about freedom, what comes to your mind? On this Sunday before the 4th of July, uh, maybe the picture of old glory, the flag flying in the wind, or the uh, Marines that we've pictured on that uh, opening video, uh, hoisting the flag on the island of I Iwo Jima, hoisting that flag. Maybe it's the picture of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, uh, maybe that comes to your mind. Maybe you see fireworks exploding as you hear the star-spangled banner sung. Pre freedom is precious to everyone. We celebrate that freedom this weekend, the freedom that is ours as citizens of the United States. Freedom that was purchased by the blood of many who died so that we might be free. And we ought to celebrate that freedom. But how much more should we celebrate the freedom that is ours as citizens of, the, of heaven? Freedom that was purchased by the blood of Jesus who died that we might be free, that our sins might be for forgiven by our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In our text this morning from, from Galatians chapter 5, we see that Paul was wrestling or continues to wrestle with the Galatians who were looking for freedom. He sees them trapped in an icy grip of legalism as they tried to approach God and earn their freedom their favor from God by keeping the law. He so desperately wanted them to uh, be free from this trap. He wanted them to experience true freedom that was theirs as children of God. This is what is available to all of us here today, true freedom. True spiritual freedom is available to all of us. This freedom doesn't mean that we are free to sin, but we are free to serve doesn't mean that we are free to be a rebel, but we are free to revel in the wonder of the abundant eternal life that Jesus has for us. It doesn't mean that we are free to be wicked, but we are free to worship, and we are free to worship here today. It doesn't mean that we are free to do things that are wrong, but we are free to do things that are right, that bring honor to God by the living of your life. It doesn't mean that you are free to do evil, but you are free to be available, to be used by God to help others know the result of this freedom, uh, this spiritual freedom, and how great it is to live in this spiritual freedom. Legalists in our church today, we talked about this in Sunday school, legalists in many churches today warn people that they dare not teach about this freedom that we have in Christ, lest it result in religious anarchy. But I want you to know that the Christian who lives by faith is not going to become a rebel. Quite the contrary, it was Warren Wearsby who writes, he is going to experience the inner discipline that is far better than any outward discipline of man-made rules. So many are afraid of teaching others about God's grace, about the fact that we no longer have to live under the weight of a heavy set of rules and regulations. They're afraid to tell folks about God's grace and the freedom that accompanies it, that they'll go out and live any way that they want and they'll forget all about God. Rules and regulations, they make us feel safe and they, feel us, they make us feel either safe or controlled depending upon one's perspective. When you, grow, when you were growing up as a teenager, you probably didn't like the rules that were set for you by your parents. Sean, did you like your rules? Clean your room, finish your meal, be home by nine o'clock, no hanging out, let me know when you get there, when you leave. You wanted to make your own decisions, you wanted to be your own man, you desired freedom. You wanted to make your own choices. You wanted to have your own place. You couldn't wait to have your own apartment so you could make your own rules. Fast forward that some 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. I bet you all wish that things were, back, things were the way they were back then. We long for freedom. We need restrictions. Well, there'll be nothing but chaos. Paul taught that salvation by grace through 
by grace through faith in Christ alone will bring true freedom to the Galatians, and we learn that for ourselves as well. Trying to earn our salvation by doing good works and by keeping the law will bring total bondage. None of us can be good enough, and none of us can keep the entirety of the law. The law says do this and don't do that. And we must do exactly what it says to find favor in God's eyes. The person who hopes to gain salvation by their own works, by their own morality, by their own virtue, by their own righteousness is enslaved to the law because we cannot and there's no way of doing everything that the law says. We can't even mess up at one point. It was James who says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. Trying to live by faith in our good works, to earn God's approval over us will only keep us in bondage. But living in faith in God's grace will bring true freedom to our lives. It's been said your worst days are never so bad that you're beyond the reach of God's grace and your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. Think about all of the promises that are fulfilled for those who have been set free. And if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you have been set free. For those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We have the promise of eternal life. We have the promise of, of, of power for every day. That same power standing in his love. That resurrection power is available to each of us as believers. We have the promise of God's wisdom for our lives. James tells us, ask and we'll receive it. We have the promise of the Holy Spirit to keep us, to convict us, to tell, teach us, and to empower us. We have the promise of answered prayer. We have the promise of fellowship. We love the fellowship with one another in the body of Christ. This freedom that is found in Christ is a precious possession. Let's look at um, <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5. Verse 1, it says, for freedom, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm there for, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Christ has set us free because of his love, because of his grace. He has set us free, so we need to stand firm there. So he's telling the believers there in Galatia that they are to stand firm in their convictions, in their faith, and not submit again to a yoke of slavery, which we so often do. This possession is precious. So many people in, our, in the world and in other places live without the freedoms that we enjoy in our nation. But unfortunately, there are many in our country who would take advantage of their freedom and it turns against them. I want to talk about some of the freedoms that we have that have turned against us. You are free to gamble. Watch TV, you see all these commercials, legalized gambling is now, gambling is now legalized in Florida. Look at all the commercials on TV. This has led to many losing everything. How many people have lost their fortunes betting? Stars, athletes have millions of dollars. You're free to purchase pornography. We're going to talk about some dirty words. This has led to the objectification of women and the unmentionable sins against children. You're free to consume alcohol. Marriages, families, and businesses have suffered greatly because of this freedom. You're free to live with someone of the opposite sex and not be married. This is attributed to the low esteem of marriage, the holy matrimony, the, 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 the ordinance that God created. Many don't think today that marriage is important. Folks today choose not to marry, but live together. You're free to practice a homosexual lifestyle or get married with someone of the same sex. You were free to have an abortion after 24 weeks. Countless lives have been lost, but praise God that that was overturned recently. I don't believe our founding fathers had these things in mind when he signed, when they signed the Declaration of Independence or when they crafted our Constitution. So many today 
take such a casual view of the freedoms that they have and they abuse it. The same can be true with our spiritual lives. Our spiritual freedom is a precious possession. Yet so many Christians abuse their spiritual freedom by deliberately, by intentionally, by willingly going against God and by sinning. And when we do that, when we do this, we endanger ourselves, we endanger our families, we endanger our witness, we endanger our church. There's a story of this state trooper in Michigan. He clocked a speeder to go in 75 in a 45 mile hour zone. He was stopped and the speeder reached into his pocket. I guess he had some kind of a seal that showed that he was some kind of a dignitary. Maybe it was on his license plate or maybe it was on the back window. He was a consul from, the, uh, from a foreign country and therefore he was immune from the law. Frustrated, the officer had to let him go. That afternoon at another place, the man was clocked again, this time going 93 into 55. The diplomat rudely announced that he had no intention of keeping the law. The, radio, the officer radioed in and was again told that there was nothing he could do. And as he handed the papers back, the officer said, even though you aren't subject to our laws, you could at least have some regard for the safety of our people. Though as sons and daughters of God, we are set free from the weight of the laws of the Old Testament, but this does not give us a right or an excuse to be lawless. Freedom in Christ doesn't give us the right to do as we please, but the power and the ability to do as we ought. Amen. Max Anders from his Holman commentary writes that. Because, our, because true spiritual freedom is such a possession, our lives should be pure and holy and upright and righteous. Not because we're trying to earn God's approval. We can't do that. But because we already have his approval and we already have his love. That's why Christ died. That's why he set us free. That's why we're free to enjoy. Isn't it a wonderful thing to have freedom, to be a free citizen of the United States of America? As bad as things are, we are a free nation. And our being able to worship here today without fear of persecution is one tremendous benefit of the freedom we enjoy in our nation. But it's an even more wonderful thing. It's an even more wonderful thing to be spiritually free. To have the promises of God fulfilled is wonderful. To have a special, uh, a wonderful possession is wonderful. True freedom is given to us by God's grace. True freedom is given because of God's love. True freedom is given to us for our enjoyment. True freedom is given for God's glory. So I challenge you this morning to get lost in your freedom. Let it move in your heart into a deeper and deeper expression of authentic worship. Let it take you into a deeper and deeper love and appreciation for God and his love for you. Let it strengthen you. Let it resolve in you. Let it strengthen your commitment to live a life of holiness and passion for God. Let it inflame you with a desire to tell others about the freedom that you have and that they can have too. Maybe you're here and you realize, I'm not at the end of my message, so don't get all happy. Maybe you're here and you realize that you're still lost, that you're, not, that you're still enslaved to sin. I want you to know that if you're here, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you can be free today. You can be free from the penalty that your sin deserves. You can be free from the consequences of not having a relationship with Jesus. You can be free, indeed, if you trust in the saving work of Jesus Christ. So I ask you, are you free? Are you free? We'll get back to that later. And if you are free, and if you are a believer, and you have this freedom, then why do so many of us live our lives as though we're still in bondage? For one thing, we often rebel, re re rebel against God, our master. We refuse to obey him, and we cling to our old lives. We hold on to that which once bound us. Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians to put off the old self. 
with its deceit and corruption and put on the new self with righteousness. He says put off lying and put on truthfulness. Put off stealing and put on usefulness and work. Put off bitterness and rage and anger that Pastor Stan talked about last week. And put on kindness and compassion and forgiveness. This is intentional. We have to be deliberate about this. We have been set free from the bondage of sin, but oftentimes we put back on the chains because we love that old life. The Christian life is one of death to self and waking up or walking, walking in newness of life. And that new life is characterized by thoughts of him who saved us, not thoughts about the flesh and the dead flesh uh, that, that we're carrying. when we're continually thinking about ourselves and indulging the, f- in, indulging the flesh in sins we've been freed from, we are essentially carrying around a dead corpse full of rottenness and death. Put that in your mind's eye for a moment. And the only way to bury that is by the power of the Spirit who is our source and our strength. Because of Jesus and his death and his resurrection. For us, on our behalf, we have freedom from guilt. We have freedom from shame. We have freedom from God's wrath. We have freedom from fear or death. Freedom from bondage to sin. We have freedom from the curse of the law. We have freedom from legalism. And we have freedom from Satan's dominion. We also have freedom to do certain things. Certain things. Freedom to approach God. Hebrews tells us, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness, the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We have freedom to relate to God as a child and as an heir. We have freedom to partake and enjoy every spiritual blessing. We have freedom to walk with God throughout our lives. We have freedom to authentically love others. Freedom to live out God's purpose in our lives. And then we have the freedom to enter heaven's gates. God is the God of freedom, true freedom. And he intends for us to live a life of freedom. Not to do whatever we want, that's surely not the case. But his freedom is for us to live a good, godly, healthy, healthy, peaceful, and prosperous life. God's freedom is meant for us to be good, to be kind, to show love to others, to be law-abiding citizens, to remain open and submissive and fully obedient to his words and his instructions. We are told of a woman in Mark chapter 4, verses 25 through 34, who suffered constant bleeding for 12 years. You're probably familiar with this story. She was held captive by a nagging hemorrhage. It was complicated. It was terrible. Her health condition deprived her of her freedom, her joy, her happiness, her peace, and even her prosperity. To make things worse, her health condition defied all medical prescriptions and treatments. She spent all that she had on doctors and wasn't helped at all, but rather grew worse. But this woman had a different thought when she heard about Jesus, about the wonderful working power, his miracle working power, about his healing and about his deliverance. She refused to resign to fate that she could never get well. She She chose to believe in her heart that Christ can heal the most chronic and severe illness and that he can restore hope to a hopeless situation. She chose to believe that the same Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, can make her whole. The Bible says that when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. She approached Jesus believing, renewing her thought and her mind, and having confidence in the ability of the master to set her free. Immediately, it says, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. So what's the application for us today with this story? The application for us today is regardless of how long you may be struggling with a persistent chronic problem, What matters is your faith in God. 
You must constantly renew your mind and your thoughts in God's faithfulness and in his ability to turn your past failures into successes. We must believe that he can turn frustrations, he can turn hopelessness, he can turn disappointments into lasting victories. We must believe that he can turn sorrows to joy and peace to calm to a stormy situation. He is able and he is mighty to accomplish infinitely more than we might think or ask. He gave sight to a man that was blind. He cured the lepers. He restored life to a man who was dead for four days. He miraculously fed 5,000 with just barley loaves and fish. And he performed so many other miracles that the book of John says they couldn't even contain them all. It's important for us to know that as his children, God's desire is to deliver us from every bondage and every oppression. He is a God of freedom. We must choose not to lose hope, but to remain calm and optimistic of what God will do. But sadly, in a country with all of these personal freedoms that we have, there are millions of citizens that are not living free but they're in bondage. So what does this freedom mean for everyday life? What are we free from? We're free from the penalty of sin. When Jesus hung on the cross, his last words were, it is finished. And this Greek word used here means that it has been paid in full. If I am in Christ, Jesus paid the penalty. The debt for my sin and my imperfection and my, was, was completely made and infinite. We're also free from the bondage of sin. Galatians 5.1 says, Christ has liberated us. Stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. This freedom Jesus secured for us with his blood is intended to keep us from being a slave to any sin in our lives. I'm not talking about Sinless perfection, because no one is perfect. But what I am talking about is being uh, in bondage to our fleshly desires. What might those be? Bondage to fear. Bondage to drugs. Bondage to alcohol. Bondage to sex. Bondage to food. Bondage to social media. Bondage is anything that controls us other than being under the influence and control and dominance of the Holy Spirit. If you're in bondage, if you're caught in the snare of a sin habit, this is not what Christ saved you for. This is not what he died for. He died for our sins, yes, but not that we should continue to live in that continual, habitual lifestyle of sin. He wants all of us to experience freedom and joy and peace. Also free from the burden of the law. There were those, when this was written, that thought that they were justified, that to be justified, they needed to be right with God and they needed to add something else. They needed to do good works. That Jesus' blood was not enough to save a person. That they must add something to what Jesus already did. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, 8 through 10 tells us, For you are saved by grace through faith, and it is not of yourselves. It is God's gift, not of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. We are saved by grace through faith. Yes, it is a gift. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it, but it is a free gift, and that's what makes it good news. Amen? I don't have to be good enough to gain salvation. I just have to accept it as a free gift from God. And this gift is irrevocable and imperishable. It's just Jesus. Jesus alone. Jesus, period. Someone might say, well, since I'm justified before God and since my sins have been paid for, 
by the blood of Jesus, I can do whatever I want. That's where verse 10 comes in. We are created for good works. Why? What am I free for? Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to be free, brothers. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. The higher path, the higher path of, is serving others and loving others. And the more we fall in love with Jesus, the more easily that is to do. So let's talk about what this Christian freedom is. What does Christian freedom look like in a practical sense? What are we free to do and not do? What can we watch on TV? What can we eat and drink? What can we wear to the beach? What about smoking and drinking? Are there limits to Christian freedom? These are good questions. Paul wrote to the church of Galatia because they were struggling with, with their new life and what they used to do, and they were eating food that was offered to idols, and that Paul said there's nothing wrong with that. Their food doesn't commend us to God. It doesn't make us any better or any worse. It's just food. It's all from the Lord. But what about these other areas that aren't in the Bible? In Corinthians 10, the, the Apostle Paul gives us practical illustrations of Christian freedom. He writes, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. We talked about that in some of our Sunday school classes today. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. In writing to the church, Paul mentions members who were eating meals, attending meals in pagan, wor in te pagan temples, just as they had done before they received Christ. They felt free to continue participating because they thought these festivals were merely an, a normal part of the social culture. They didn't see what they were doing, their actions as pagan worship. So Paul lays out several warnings, reminding them of their dangerous flirtation with idolatry. Everything is permissible. We talked about this in Sunday school. In a land, in a, in a, in a, in a place where, where everything was at your fingertips, all of the, everything that you wanted was in Corinth. The, 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 believer, the believers thought that because it was available, it was, it was okay to, to be involved in. But not everything that is available, that is uh, uh, before us, is, uh, is good for us. Right? We know that? Paul says Christians have a great deal of freedom in Christ, but however, not everything is beneficial or constructive. Our freedom in Christ must be balanced with a desire to build up and benefit others. When deciding how to exercise our freedom, we ought to seek the good of others before our own good. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. And if what we do causes our brothers to stumble, we shouldn't do it. Even if we believe we are right and have a Christian freedom in an area, if our actions will cause another brother or sister to stumble in their faith, we are to refrain out of love. <clears throat> Last week at our men's breakfast, Dave, I'm going to put you on the spot, brother. Last week at our men's breakfast, I, uh, I was sitting across from Dave Newton. And Dave didn't really have a lot of food on his plate. So I asked Dave, what's going on? Are you okay? And he told me, with a real scowl on his face. I'm dieting. For anyone eating across from me, that's not a good thing. <laughs> so I was asking him, was what I was doing causing him to stumble? And again, he looked down, very angry. And he says, as he was eating his fruit, no. <laughs> I had three plates of food. I was like a drum set. Michael, I had boom, boom, boom. I was like, boom, all over the place. Biscuits and gravy and casserole and eggs and sausage and French toast, Tammy. Some of the gray areas that are in our lives, <clears throat> that arise in our Christian walk, Romans 14.1 calls these disputable matters, areas where the Bible doesn't give us clear-cut guidelines on what behavior is a sin or not. 
want you to know when we're faced with these gray areas, we can rely on two guiding principles <clears throat> that regulate our freedom. Let love for others compel us not to cause anyone to stumble. And let our desire to glorify God be our all-encompassing motive. Does it cause my brother to stumble, and will it bring glory to God? We have tremendous freedom in Christ. Let's live like we're free. Let's not be in bondage to our sin. Let's glorify God in all that we do. Whatever you do, whether you eat or not, it says, bring glory to God. Maybe you're here today and you don't know this freedom that I've talked about. Today, I want you to know that whatever it is that you're holding on to, whatever it is that's got you bound up, chained up, you can be free of by surrendering it to Jesus Christ, by giving it to God, by asking Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. It's so simple. You just have to admit what God already knows, that we are all fall short and of the glory of God, that none of us are perfect. We need Jesus in our lives to be the bridge that connects us to a holy God. We can't live the way we are in our sin and not have a relationship with God. We can, but the consequences are not good. So if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus, I invite you, Christ invites you to come to the altar at the time of invitation and let somebody know of a decision that you need to make. Let me know and I'll pray with you and turn you over to a counselor. Maybe you're here and you're wanting freedom from a sin that you've been holding on to. You're a believer. Why don't you come to the altar and pray and, and release it and let God have it? Experience the freedom, the joy, the peace that he has for you, that he desires for you. Maybe you're here and you're looking for a church. Why don't you come and at the, come to the, uh, to the front during the invitation time and let me know, and I'll be happy to pray with you and have you become a part of this family called North Oak. Whatever decision you need to make, as the music uh, plays, as we sing this song, uh, I'd ask you to come and be responsive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. This is not my words. These are the words of the Lord. This is the Spirit of God moving in this place, bringing conviction and challenging and, and, and empowering you to be strong in your struggle. Whatever it is, be obedient to God now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Father, for the decisions that will be made. Lord, we uh, hold on to hope and expectation that there's uh, someone here today who needs to uh, embrace uh, your uh, love and your forgiveness and uh, have the freedom that's found only in Christ. Maybe there are some, Lord, who are struggling with uh, something that's holding them in bondage. And, Father, we know that uh, your desire is for us to be free of that and to not uh, walk in sin, but to have uh, uh, freedom and uh, have a, a strong relationship with you. I, and I know that sin uh, doesn't uh, bring us close to you. It just drives us further away. So, Lord, whatever it is that needs to happen uh, during this time, your invitation, I pray that uh, we would be responsive, we would be obedient, and that we would do it all for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.